So hello everyone and welcome to America and the refugee crisis from 1938 to 1945. We are so pleased you decided to join us. My name is Isabella Rowan and I am the program coordinator at Delray Beach Public Library. Tonight's Zoom lecture is part of a series of programs presented in conjunction with the Americans and the Holocaust exhibition. As you may know, and we're very proud of this, Delray Beach Public Library is one of 50 libraries selected by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the American Library Association to host the Americans and the Holocaust Traveling Exhibition. The exhibition on view here at the library now through November 17th examines the motives, pressures, and fears that shaped Americans' responses to Nazism, war, and genocide from 1933 to 1945. Americans in the Holocaust explores four main questions. What did Americans know? Did Americans help Jewish refugees? Why did Americans go to war? And how did Americans respond to the Holocaust? We hope that the exhibition and our Zoom lecture tonight encourage you to reflect on these questions, both in regard to the history and our roles and responsibilities today. After this program, we hope you continue to engage with the history, come and visit the exhibition, and as always, speaking as a librarian, read more books. We are proud to bring this exhibition to Delray Beach to the Delray Beach community and look forward to the conversations that it will spark. Please be sure to see the exhibit at the library before it closes on November 17th. And I hope you will join us at our future programs as well. The complete program guide is available online and all events are free and open to the public, but please keep in mind that advanced registration is required. And I can't see it at the moment, but I think my colleague Allison just put the log, the link to the program guide in the chat box in case you need to be find it quickly. Tonight's program is being provided by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum with additional support provided by the Women's National Book Association South Florida chapter. A huge, huge thank you to both organizations for their support of this program. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Rebecca Erbelding. She is the author of Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe, published by Doubleday in 2018 and available for checkout at the Delray Beach Public Library. It won the National Jewish Book Award for Excellence in Writing Based on Archival Research. Dr. Erbelding holds a PhD in American history from George Mason University and has been an historian, curator, and archivist at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum for the past 18 years. She served as the lead historian on the museum's special exhibition, Americans and the Holocaust. Join me in welcoming Dr. Erbelding. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'm I'm so thrilled to speak with you. My colleagues and I have been looking forward to this moment literally for two years. Today is the first day that the traveling exhibition is open to the public. Um, so this is literally the first program that we're having. It was supposed to open back in March of 2020. And so we've been waiting not only through the period of developing the exhibition, but I know Isabella and the other 50 librarians have really been waiting to bring this to you and planning programming and, and Delray Beach has a vast array of programming. So please do check out that um, very ambitious and exciting brochure and, and amount of program that you have. Um, and if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, and I'm guessing most of you haven't, please do um, stop by and visit it. Um, we're really excited to hear what kind of conversations that it sparks for people. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now in the hopes that you'll be able to see it. And I'm going to really talk today about the Jewish refugee crisis. Um, the crisis in the late 1930s and early 1940s as hundreds of thousands of European Jews are desperately trying to flee a continent that is being increasingly controlled by Nazi Germany and its allies. I know this is the topic that a lot of people have lots of questions about. And so I'm gonna save some time at the end and I can answer anything that you have about this, um, about this very complex topic. So a refugee crisis never comes out of the blue. There are lots of things that lead up to it. It's always complicated. 
And it's important to look back, not just because, not just to use hindsight to judge, we don't wanna do that, but to consider the context of the time. Um, so we're gonna start in 19, uh, 1918 at the end of World War I. Um, the United States is only really involved in World War I for a very short period of time, but the whole experience, um, especially the perceived failure of the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, all of this idea of isolationism, it convinces Americans that we are best served if we stay on our side of the Atlantic, that um, getting involved in any sort of war, any sort of overseas conflict is a mistake, that World War I had been a mistake and a mistake that we should have avoided getting involved in. The United States is also segregated. It is segregated legally in many places. It is segregated by custom in others. And Americans are very concerned about the conceptions of race and genetics. Um, there are new immigration laws that I'll get to and talk about in a minute that are based in eugenic science, this idea that biologically some people are better than others. There's also the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan reemerges in the 1920s with the slogan, 100% American. Um, they have millions of card carrying members. And if you look at this picture from 1927, you can see a Ku Klux Klan march on Washington, but you can also see all the spectators in the background. These are not protesters. These are not counter protesters. These are people who are coming to see the Klan. Um, it was a very popular thing in the 1920s. And so these factors, this isolationism, this anti-Semitism and racism, um, all of this converges in the 1920s and leads to the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act of 1924. Um, this act ends the idea that we all have in our heads about immigrants arriving at Ellis Island, showing their paperwork and being permitted to enter the United States. Um, from here on, there are numerical limits on the number of people who can come to the United States. It is capped at about 153,000 people per year. And due to all of the racial theories I mentioned, the idea that biologically some people are better than others, that is actually broken down by country. So that 153,000 is divvied up by different countries. And you, as a prospective immigrant, have to apply for the number of quota slots allocated for your country of birth, not your country of citizenship or where you're living, but where you were born because that is what eugenics was based on, this idea that where you were born determined what kind of person that you were going to be. These were national origins quotas. Um, they remain in place until 1924, all of, or I'm sorry, 1965, these limits, um, more than 40 years. And this quota breakdown really favors Western and Northern Europeans, people who are considered really assimilable, um, who could easily assimilate into the United States. These were countries that in the 1920s, the American congressmen who were putting these laws into place thought these were reliably white Protestants, white Protestant nations that would send white Protestant immigrants. There are far fewer slots available for countries in Southern and Eastern Europe where Catholics and Jews lived and almost no slots available for anybody born in Asia or Africa. Um, so some, some countries only had quotas of 100. Some people are banned entirely based on racial grounds. These are also maximums. They are not goals to hit. So that 153,000 is the maximum number available, um, not, uh, not some sort of goal that the United States is trying to reach. And really crucially for understanding Americans' response to the Holocaust, the State Department decided whether you were qualified to become an immigrant in the country in which you were living. So you have to present all of your paperwork in the country you're living, you get a visa, and then you arrive in the United States. You can wave at the Statue of Liberty with ease. You'll go through a very cursory medical check, but all of the paperwork, all of the applications, all of the permissions are done in your country where you're living. Um, there is also something crucial that is missing from this slide describing Johnson Reed, and that is the question of refugees. The United States actually has no refugee policy until after World War II. So um, there is no refugee policy. You cannot come as a migrant. You cannot seek asylum. Uh, everything is done through this very slow and deliberate immigration process based in the 1920s laws. So there are no new laws in the 1930s to make immigration easier on Jews trying to flee Europe or to make immigration harder. We have the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, which from 1924, 
which is, as I said, in place until 1965 and is really the thing that people are trying to navigate. So you can see um, in, in 1929, the annual quota based on that 1924 law for people in Germany was 25,957. It's actually the second highest quota of any country in the world, second to Great Britain, um, with the idea that in, in the 1920s, Congress thought that Germany produced reliably white Protestant immigrants. But this is the same year, of course, that the State Depart or that the Great Depression starts. Um, the stock market crashes, and the United States and a lot of the world descends into an economic depression. As one of his responses, President Herbert Hoover at the time um, instructs the State Department to make sure that immigrants will not become a public charge. Um, this was an old uh, immigration law, a provision of a very old immigration law that really wasn't being enforced in the 1920s. Hoover brings it back in 1929 and says, you cannot need any sort of financial support if you are to immigrate to the United States. So if an immigrant didn't already have a job lined up or didn't have enough money to support themselves indefinitely with the idea that they may never find a job during depression era United States, it was nearly impossible for that person to get a visa to the US. So we can see how this manifests. Um, so you can see like during the 1920s, for the most part, the quota is being filled or close to it. And then you see after Hoover's instruction, immigration really plummets um, to 54,000 1931. By 1933, 8,220, the lowest recorded immigration in American history up to that point. So in 1933, Adolf Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany in January, and six weeks later, Franklin Roosevelt becomes President of the United States, takes the oath of office, promises the country a new deal, and vows that the only thing that Americans have to fear is fear itself. Of course, Americans looking around the country and looking around the world disagree with this. We are at 25% of the workforce unemployed. It is unimaginable, um, the idea that we don't have anything to fear anymore. And Americans are also looking across the ocean and they are seeing Nazi Germany and its new leader, Adolf Hitler. Reports of the persecution of German Jews are on the front page of newspapers throughout the country in the spring of 1933. It's right next to news of the end of prohibition, the beginning of the New Deal. Um, you can see this Miami Her Herald from March 29th, 1933, that has right in the middle, German Nazis give order to boycott Jews. This is three days before the April 1st national boycott of Jewish-owned businesses by the Nazi party. So Americans and, and people in Florida knew about the boycott in advance of it actually happening. The same is true of book burning. This is reported in American newspapers in advance of it actually happening in Germany. The Nazis were very clear about what they were trying to do. And thousands of Americans are reading this information and we know that they're reading this information and paying attention to it because we can track a reaction to it. Um, thousands of Americans from 29 states and Washington DC sent petitions to the State Department and to FDR asking for some sort of protest. There are mass meetings in Miami in March and in May to protest Nazi Germany. So this petition was sent to the State Department after the May meeting um, and the protest uh, against book burning is, is great. Um, whereas by this grotesque spectacle without counterpoint since the dark ages, the world is compelled to witness the degradation of a once great people by its temporary and momentary rulers, who by their insane conduct are subjecting Hitler Germany to the ridicule and contempt of civilizations. And whereas every book and pamphlet and scrap of paper consigned to the flames of Germany this night can be replaced a thousandfold. So this is held in Temple Israel. Um, it is hundreds of Floridians. Um, they say that they are irrespective of race and creed, and they are all protesting what the Nazis are doing, asking for some sort of State Department response, some sort of response from the president. The problem is that Americans historically have a very short attention span. And after this initial protest, this wave of initial protests um, in the spring of 1933, Americans largely stopped paying attention. The issue falls from the front pages. Roosevelt is more, and the country tends to be more concerned about the domestic problems, about the, um, the economic depression and recovery from that than they are about anything happening in Germany. Um, the United States is focused on that solely. 
1937, um, so four years later, a new economic recession begins and unemployment comes back up to uh, 19%. Problems overseas from the 1935 um, invasion of Ethiopia by Italy, the, the invasion of um, the Japanese invasion of China, the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. All of these things are happening in the mid 1930s and Americans are doubling, tripling down on isolationism. We are not going to get involved. This is not our problem. We have enough problems at home. But for thousands of people who are seeking refuge, the United States still represents this land of freedom and opportunity. And this land that is far away across the ocean from the persecution that they know at home. And throughout the 1930s, the early 1930s, more than 90,000 Germans, mostly Jews, remain on waiting lists to get US immigration visas. Um, the State Department slowly over the course of the decade begins to increase the number of visas that they're issued, that they're issuing, but the quotas are not maxed out, far from it. Um, in 1933-34, the first full quota year after Hitler takes power in Germany, only a little more than 4,000 visas are issued under the German quota, which again is about 26,000 visas legally available. They only issue about 4,000 of them. So let's talk for a minute about what it takes to immigrate to the United States. Don't bother trying to read all of this. The, the point is that it's a lot. Um, but, but often people ask, well, why didn't the Jews just leave? This is a question that the teachers that we work with get from students all the time. Why didn't the Jews just leave? And the answer is that it was very hard to leave and it was equally hard to find a place to go. Potential immigrants had to, sh had to prove their identities with birth certificates, marriage certificates, military discharge papers, passports. They had to show that they were good citizens with citizenship papers, um, permission slips from the police saying that they were not criminals. They needed um, discharge papers. They needed tax certificates. They needed, you can see up here, you know, this is just um, a list of a family's belongings all of the things that they owned so that the Nazis could tax them against everything they owned. They also, for most people, needed a financial sponsor, an American who was willing to vouch for them that they would never become a public charge based on that Hoover instruction from 1930. So the American sponsor needed to submit their own tax documents, their bank statements, insurance statements, often um, employer letters or letters of recommendation from fellow citizens saying that they're a good person who will not abandon their relative or their friend if that person is allowed to immigrate. Um, some of these documents have expiration dates. Many of them need to be gotten in a certain order. Um, and the ramifications of, of missing something or um, having something that expired are really very real. Uh, Dorothy Thompson, the famous journalist, wrote in 1938 in a book called Refugee. Um, it is a fantastic commentary on the inhumanity of our times that for thousands and thousands of people, a piece of paper with a stamp on it is the difference between life and death. It is clear by 1938 that life in Germany is becoming unbearable to Jews. In March, Germany annexes Austria, bringing about 192,000 additional Jews under German control. Thousands are waiting outside the waiting list or um, outside the consulates every day. You can see this line outside of um, Vienna. It's kind of fuzzy, but but that's what the, the photo is meant to be. Um, in Washington, President Roosevelt combines the German and the Austrian quotas, but that still means that there's only 27,370 visas available each year for anybody born in Germany or Austria. Roosevelt also calls an international conference. He says, this is an international problem, this refugee problem. We need an international solution to it. 32 nations gather in Evian in France in July, 1938. And you can see the headline, yes, but attitude perils progress. All of these nations stand up and say, yes, we know it's a problem, but we cannot do anything about it. We are not going to take new immigrants. They claim economic reasons. Some of them claim racial reasons. We do not have, Australia says, we do not have a racial problem. We do not wish to import a racial problem, meaning we don't want Jews. On November 10th, 1938, 9th and 10th, 1938, in response to the assassination of a minor uh, German diplomat in Paris, the Nazis unleashed Kristallnacht, uh, a coordinated terror campaign throughout Germany, burning hundreds of synagogues, 
Um, more than 30,000 men and boys, Jewish men and boys are sent to concentration camps and arrested. Um, Kristallnacht results in the longest and largest sustained newspaper coverage of any event in the United States related to the persecution of Jews. It is front page news in the US for about three weeks. Um, you can see this headline, which is um, about 12 days after Kristallnacht uh, in the LA Examiner, Nazis warn world Jews will be wiped out unless evacuated by democracies. Roosevelt condemns the Kristallnacht attacks. He summons the US ambassador back from Berlin. The US is the only country to recall its ambassador um, in response to Kristallnacht. And um, following Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins suggestion, he allows um, German Jews who are here on tourist visas, visitor visas, to stay indefinitely if they don't feel safe going home. And so it starts with six months and, and it extends throughout the war. So somewhere between 12 and 15,000 people um, are able to, to come to the, or stay in the United States because they don't feel safe going home. Americans are conflicted about what to do about this refugee crisis. Many Americans are sympathetic. You can see this poll um, from November, 1938, right after Kristallnacht. About two weeks later, Americans are polled. Do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? And 94% of Americans disapprove. And then the exact same people are asked, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States to live? And 72% of those people say no. So this gap between sympathy and willingness to act um, is a persistent disconnect throughout this entire period. Americans are sympathetic to what is happening but they do not wish to be part of what then was the obvious solution, which is get those people out of there, some sort of immigration process. And as I said, thousands of people joined the waiting list to immigrate to the United States. Um, Germany, as I said, had the second largest quota of any nation. And in 1939, that quota was entirely filled. All 27,370 visas were issued. In 1940, 27,355 visas were issued, all but 15. And since all of this was done by telegram and by paper and not by computer, I think it is probably a clerical error that they did not issue all of the visas available. Um, at the same time, the waiting lists are growing. You can see here, January 1st, 1939, the number of applicants on the waiting list for Germany is, is nine years worth of that quota. Um, and people elsewhere are getting nervous. In Romania, it's numerically a 43-year wait to get a U.S. visa. And Americans are polled on another important question at that same time. Do you support, you know, your member of Congress? If you were a member of Congress, would you vote to allow a larger number of European refugees than currently admitted? Um, and 83% of Americans said no to that. Roosevelt cannot do much without Congress. Congress controls U.S. immigration law. And even members, and especially members of his own Democratic Party, are the ones who are the strongest against enlarging the quota. Um, many more bills are in, introduced to tighten immigration laws even further rather than to relax them. Uh, Robert Reynolds, a Democrat from North Carolina, wrote a letter to his fellow citizens in March 1939, where he says, all of the nations of impoverished Europe wish to dump their political, economic, and undesired minorities upon us. Write to your senators and your congressmen to aid me to put legislation on the statute books, which will shut off immigration entirely during this period of unemployment and hardship and distress for young and old among our people. And furthermore, to expel from this country the alien propagandist, the habitual criminal, and the alien diseased or insane. Remember too that this is 1939. Newspapers are reporting that Europe is at the verge of war. And when war does begin on September 1st, 1939, 90% of Americans still want to remain neutral. Even one of Reynolds refrains, even at the face of allowing in German refugee children, people between the ages of five and 14 years old, was that America's children are America's problem and Europe's children are Europe's problem. This is not our problem to deal with. We need to let Europe deal with itself. While Reynolds is saying all of this, um, saying what many Americans are thinking, um, others are feeling differently. And I, I wanna quickly highlight one couple, um, Waitstill and Martha Sharp. So Waitstill was a Unitarian minister in Massachusetts and in early 1939, um, 
after Kristallnacht, after witnessing the Nazi annexation of parts of Czechoslovakia, he and his young wife, Martha, uh, traveled to Prague. They are there, they are helping Jewish refugees, they are helping refugee children get to Great Britain. Um, and they're there when the Nazis take the rest of the country. They witness Adolf Hitler on the streets of Prague um, giving speeches and annexing the rest of the country. They spend their time distributing aid, helping students and professors find universities in the United States. Um, and they act as liaisons for numerous Americans, uh, American organizations who are trying to distribute aid. Um, after they leave uh, Prague, they'll go to Southern France. They'll do the same thing after the Nazi invasion of France in 1940. Um, I point this out because the library will be hosting a screening of a film about the Sharps produced by Ken Burns on October 16th. It's a great film and you should definitely check out that program. Um, but to go back to what it was like for a refugee in Europe, Dr. Franz Goldberger, uh, a professor from Vienna, is an example of somebody who wanted to get out. He did not have someone who could act as, as, as his American financial sponsor. He did not know anyone in the United States. So he got telephone books, he got directories of organizations that he was affiliated with, and he wrote to everybody he can think of. Um, so much so that we actually discovered this story because we figured out that we had three different collections at the museum about Franz Goldberger, that he had written to so many people that two letters and a case file about him survived long enough to make it to the Holocaust Museum as donations 80 years later. So we have multiple letters of him asking for help. Um, you can see here, this is from part of his case file, the clearing process shows that he was known to all of these different agencies. He had written to everybody. Um, he, two individuals um, and one organization donated this stuff to the museum. You know, this letter, the attention to this case was called when a member of our community totally unknown to Dr. Goldberger received a letter from him. Um, he sent out same, same man, similar letter. He sent out a, a cover letter in this case to Benjamin Davis of Walton High School. Um, he says that he found his name in a member directory probably because Franz Goldberger was also teaching at a commercial school at the time. And he encloses his resume uh, with a picture. He says he's 40 years old. Um, he, when Nazi Germany annexed Austria, he lost his teaching position. Since then, if you look down here, he's, he's been trying to learn a skill. Um, he has learned the following handicrafts from the Vienna Jewish community, shoe repairs, manicures, hairdressing, gardening. Um, he says, I don't shirk from work. I will accept manual labor. He just needs somebody to help him get out. In the spring of 1940, Franz Goldberger gets incredibly lucky. His letter reached the assistant postmistress of Eagle Grove, Iowa, a woman named Helen Roseland. Um, she was Lutheran. She expressed that her faith made her very sympathetic to the plight of refugees. Um, she had never spoken to Franz. She did not know him. His letter came completely out of the blue, but she wanted to help him. So she got in touch with the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, who ran one of the largest non-Jewish aid organizations assisting refugees in making connections. Um, Helen wrote an affidavit for Franz vowing to take personal financial responsibility for him uh, if he was able to reach the United States. In the spring of 1940, um, it was the first few months of World War II, some in Western Europe called it the phony war. Uh, England and France were at war with Nazi Germany, but there really wasn't a lot of fighting in Western Europe. It was almost all in Poland and then Poland fell. Um, so when Nazi Germany invades first Norway and Denmark, and then in May, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, um, this is a huge shock to the American people. This is a huge shock to everybody. Um, by June, by mid-June, France has fallen. It falls in about a month and a half, really, really quickly. Um, and Americans start seeing newsreel footage of Hitler standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. And this really makes everybody afraid. Poland seemed far away. France, many Americans had been to France. They have some sort of emotional attachment to France and to the idea of Paris. And so seeing Hitler there um, was a really striking thing. And Americans realized also that suddenly Great Britain is the only bulwark between Nazi Germany and the United States. And so the war begins to come home. The war starts to feel real. And Americans begin to worry 
that the United States was vulnerable to. Not only if Nazi Germany decided to invade the United States, remember that the United States, we have been isolationist for more than 20 years at this point. We do not have a large standing army. It is very difficult, I think, for Americans, especially young Americans to realize this, but in 1939, when Europe goes to war, the United States has the 17th largest army in the world, smaller than Romania, smaller than smaller standing army than Belgium. We are vulnerable. We have a very large coastline. And Americans begin to fear that we are vulnerable from the inside, that Nazi Germany may be um, starting a fifth column, a, a group of spies and saboteurs inside the country waiting to bring the country down as soon as they cross the border. And um, you can see that as France falls, 93% of Americans, 71% yes, 22% not sure, either think that Nazi Germany has already begun to organize this fifth column or that they're, they're about to. The FBI begins receiving thousands of tips a day from people who suspect that their neighbors might be spies or their neighbors might be involved in sabotage. Popular magazines have articles like this one um, or articles written by the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, warning of the Nazi threat. This one is Hitler's slave spies in America, um, reporting that the Nazis are trying to sneak spies in disguised as refugees. Um, even Roosevelt says this, Roosevelt gives a press conference in June 1940, and he says that there are refugees coming who are secretly Nazi spies. They might not want to be spies, but the Nazis have their parents um, hostage back in Nazi Germany in exchange for those acts of spying and sabotage. So the State Department eventually and originally rejects Helen Rosen's affidavit. Um, it's insufficient. She doesn't have a relationship with him. She needs more proof. Um, so she submits more documents, more evidence, another affidavit. And finally, in the spring of 1941, she hears that her affidavit is about to be accepted, that there might be enough to finally get him here. Franz still needs a ship ticket. Remember that he has lost his job as a professor three years earlier, and he probably doesn't have very much money at all. And I want to take a minute with this postcard because I really do think it's it's incredible. Um, so she writes, I sent another affidavit about two weeks ago. I heard from the Hamburg America line, the shipping line in New York to send four hundred and twenty five dollars. Um, well, yesterday I went to the bank. I borrowed one hundred and ninety, which I sent a girl in Los Angeles is sending two twenty five and a man in Brooklyn. Ten dollars. It will be cabled very soon, I think. So this is three people organizing by mail across the United States to send the modern equivalent of $7,000 for a man that they've never met. And you can see that she writes at the end, Mr. Goldberger is now in a concentration camp out of Vienna. It is a terrible place. A few days later, she writes to the Quakers and she says that she has purchased the ship ticket, that he has a ticket on a ship leaving from Spain, June 29th, 1941. So at this point, the ship ticket actually replaces the affidavit on the most difficult things to get. Um, it is the most crucial piece of documentation by 1941. Between 1938 and 1941, more than 111,000 self-identified Jewish refugees immigrate to the United States. Um, but you can see that the outbreak of war has a really serious effect on who can come and from where. Um, between January and October 1939, you can see that there's, sorry, that there's 35,000 people coming on 486 ships. The same period of time, two years later, there are only 88 ships crossing the Atlantic, bringing passengers to the United States. Um, when you go to the exhibit, you will see that we have an animated graphic showing ships um, carrying Jewish refugees to the United States. And I want to show you two quick clips just so you can see visually the impact of this. So here is 1938. You can see that ships are arriving um, from all over Europe. People are coming from Hamburg and um, France and Antwerp and, and everywhere, Liverpool. They are coming in the thousands every month. Um, these are all ships carrying people who are self-identified as Jewish refugees. When you look at 1941, my mouse, um, this is what it looks like. There are only a few ships a month, almost all of them from Lisbon. And what that means is that if you are a refugee um, in the Netherlands who is trying to get out, 
you also have to factor how you are going to make it to Lisbon, how you are going to cross a continent at war um, in order to find a ship that can actually physically take you to the United States. I'm gonna finish Franz's story in a minute, but I wanna introduce one last uh, example. This is the Frank family. Um, you probably recognize them or you may. Uh, Otto and Edith Frank and their daughters, Margot and Anne. Um, they were all born in Germany, so they all um, existed under the German quota, had to apply for the German quota because they were German born. Um, as soon as Hitler comes to power, they become refugees. They leave their home in Frankfurt and they reestablish their lives in Amsterdam. On April 30th, 1941, Otto wrote to his American friend, um, Nathan Strauss. Uh, they were long friends. They had met at Heidelberg University when Nathan was an exchange student. Um, if you are going to have an American financial sponsor, you cannot do better than Nathan Strauss. Nathan Strauss was the son of the co-founder of Macy's department store, so he had money. Um, and in 1941, when Otto is writing to him, he is the administrator of the U.S. Housing Authority. So he is high up in the Roosevelt administration. He has money. He has connections. Um, if you are looking for somebody, you can't do any better. And Otto writes here, I'm forced to look out for immigration. And as far as I can see, USA is the only country we could go to. Perhaps you remember I have two girls. It is for the sake of the children mainly that we must care for. Um, our fate is of less importance. He says here in this paragraph, in 1938, I filed an application at Rotterdam to immigrate to the United States, but the papers have been destroyed there. What he's referencing is that in May 1940, um, when the Nazis invaded the Netherlands, they bombed central Rotterdam. And in that bombing, they actually destroyed the US consulate. They destroyed the consulate, all of the paperwork that all of the refugees in the Netherlands had gathered there. Um, Rotterdam was, had been the only immigration visa issuing consulate in the Netherlands. So it destroyed everybody's paperwork and it destroyed the waiting list. The waiting list was only kept on paper. And so um, in the aftermath, US diplomats tried to reconstruct the waiting list, but for some unknown reason, it doesn't look like Otto reapplied. Um, but by 1941, immigration is so difficult that the US cancels the waiting list and says, if you are under the German quota and you have your paperwork in order and you have your ship ticket, you can request your interview. Um, we can expedite this. We can get you out of here. The waiting list does not matter anymore. So at this point, when Otto is writing, World War II is nearly two years old. The US still does not want to get involved. Um, the American people don't anyway. Um, but staying out seems less and less likely. We've just passed Lend-Lease. We have a peacetime draft, the first peacetime draft in American history. And on June 22nd, 1941, the Nazis invade the Soviet Union. At the beginning of June, 1941, uh, the State Department sends a cable to consulates in Europe, instructing them that no more visas should be issued to anybody in Nazi occupied territory. People with close relatives in Nazi occupied territory are also declared ineligible because of these fear of spies and sabotage. Um, due to espionage fears, the United States also orders all German consulates in the United States to close. In retaliation, the Nazis order all US consulates in Nazi occupied territory and Italy to close. And so for anybody who is still in Nazi territory in the spring or in, by July, 1941, it becomes almost impossible for you to get out because there is no more diplomatic personnel, no more American diplomatic personnel to give you your interview and, and issue your visa. There is one last bureaucratic change. Um, all visa applications also now have to pass through an interdepartmental visa review committee in Washington. And if you know anything about bureaucracy, you can imagine the months that this added to an already very difficult immigration process. So after July 1941, very, very few people can escape. And after October 1941, Nazi Germany declares immigration illegal from its territory, Jer Jewish immigration illegal. On September 8th, 1941, Otto Frank writes to Nathan Strauss again, and he has another idea. He says, visas for the US cannot be obtained here, but there's a chance to leave the country, and, uh, but there's no chance to leave the country without a visa. Um, the only ways to get to a neutral country um, are visas from other states such as Cuba. Visitor visas to Cuba seem the only way, and as the Cuban consulate is close to, nobody knows what should be done. 
Edith urges me to leave alone or with the children. In December 1941, of course, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. The United States officially enters World War II. Um, Otto Frank's application for a Cuban visa is canceled. The US um, government created propaganda posters during the war that framed the war about being about democracy and freedom. So you see Nazi daggers or Nazis sticking daggers through the Bible, um, Nazis crumbling up the constitution and the bill of rights and freedoms. Um, and this is, the, this is the way that the war was framed to the American people. It was not framed as a war to rescue Jews. The United States does not go to war to rescue Jews or to assist Jews. Um, this is how it is marketed to the United States people or to the American people. And this is why we go to war. We go to war because we're attacked. Um, but in 1942, um, the United States and Americans learn for the first time that the Nazis have a plan to murder the Jews of Europe, that persecution has escalated into murder. Um, this discovery in November 1942, this revelation in American newspapers, is the same month that the Allies invade North Africa. Uh, it's almost a year after Pearl Harbor, and the Allies are thousands of miles away from the killing centers where most Jews are being murdered at this point. For most of 1943, more and more information is reaching the United States about what is happening to people. There's more and more pressure on the US government to do something about it. And finally, in January 1944, Roosevelt signs an executive order. Um, he establishes a war refugee board, um, an official government agency. He declares that it is US policy to try to rescue Jews, to try to provide relief. Um, and among a myriad of other things, this agency, you know, this idea that it is now the United States's policy to try to rescue Jews. Um, this agency does a ton of things. They open, um, they hire the now famous rescuer Raoul Wallenberg. They send him to Budapest. They open a refugee camp in upstate New York. They bring about a thousand mostly Jewish refugees to live there. This is the only group of refugees that come to the United States outside of our immigration law. Um, they release detailed information about Auschwitz to the, um, to the press in November 1944 that results in headline news and the Washington Post writing an editorial entitled genocide, the first time that word is used in an American newspaper. So in 1944, the United States actually does announce a policy of rescue and relief. At the same time, it is already 1944, more than four and a half million Jews have already been murdered. Our exhibit ends with the end of the war in Europe. Um, here's here's uh, the report that the War Refugee Board issues and then the, the genocide editorial. Um, in April 1945, General Eisenhower tours the Ordrif concentration camp. And despite all of the wartime intelligence that he has, all of the reports in newspapers, he's absolutely horrified by what he sees. And he immediately calls members of Congress and journalists to come and bear witness. Um, he orders all soldiers in the vicinity of a concentration camp to come and bear witness, um, saying that he is afraid that this will someday become propaganda, um, that it'll be chalked up to just um, the allies making these claims against the Nazis. And he wants to um, really document that this is actually what happened. Um, this is the news in Europe in the spring of 1945 and the news in the United States is the death of FDR. Um, Roosevelt dies the exact same day that Eisenhower tours Ordruff and Roosevelt does not live to see images of the liberation of camps. The war in Europe ends in early May, 1945, the same time that Americans see visual evidence for the first time about the Holocaust. Um, in February, 1942, going back, Helen Roseland writes to the Quakers to see if they know what happened to Franz Goldberger. He didn't show up for the ship. Um, his ticket went unused, her money had been refunded. And she writes in this letter, do you have any way of knowing what became of Goldberger? I'm praying that he'll live through this ordeal and yet come here. Um, and then she writes, I've heard that many of them, meaning Jews, were driven to Poland and there they are dying in large numbers. It is all very sad. So a rural postmistress in Eagle Grove, Iowa, was paying attention and knew enough about what was happening that in 1942, uh, eight months before this information is revealed to the American public in newspapers, she is paying attention and saying that she knows that people are being driven to Poland and dying in large numbers. 
Um, we are not sure whether Franz Goldberger's visa application got stuck somewhere. We don't know whether he wasn't allowed to leave Vienna or if he'd gotten arrested, if he tried to enter France, tried to catch the boat, if he even knew that his affidavit had been sent. Um, but what we do know is that Franz Goldberger was arrested in Vienna in May 1942. He was deported to Izbica, which is near Lublin in, in Nazi-occupied Poland, and from there to Majdanek. Um, he died in Majdanek on August 20th, 1942. Uh, this is the, the list um, from his death. Otto Frank, of course, uh, his visa application to Cuba was, um, was rejected after Pearl Harbor. Uh, he kept filling out immigration paperwork with the idea that, you know, maybe something would happen and he and his family would be able to leave. But by the beginning of 1942, it became very clear that that was not going to happen. And so he started to prepare a hiding place for them. Um, on July 6th, 1942, the Frank family went into hiding uh, in an annex behind his business. And they hid there for more than two years until they were discovered by the Gestapo in early August, 1942. Um, they were arrested. They were on the very last transport from the Netherlands to Auschwitz. Um, Otto was the only member of the secret annex to survive the war. Uh, his daughters, Margo and Anne, died of typhus in Bergen-Belsen only a few weeks before the camp was liberated by the British. Um, and in 1947, Otto uh, published Anne's diary of their time in hiding. So many, many things change in the United States between 1933 and 1945. We are fundamentally a different country. Um, we, uh, unemployment has fallen. It is less than 5% in 1945. Millions of women joined the workforce. More than 16 million Americans served in uniform, um, more than a 10th of the US population. And so we are no longer an isolationist country. We are an emerging superpower. Um, we are never again going to stand on our side of the Atlantic. Um, and before the, word, the war ends, Americans learned the word genocide for the first time. Um, but some things do not change very much. There is a poll in December 1945, should we allow more refugees to enter the United States than we had before the war? And only 5% of Americans say yes. Um, so America has always struggled with these really um, fundamental evergreen questions about who we are, what our roles and responsibilities are as a nation and as a community and as individuals. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now in the hopes that you have questions um, and I am happy to answer any of the questions that you have. So thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Erbelding for sharing that with us. It's very enlightening, sobering, um, informative, all of that. Uh, does, does anyone have any questions or comments about what you've just seen? If you don't like to chat, go ahead and raise your hand. Yes, I see Eva has her hand up. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, okay. There you are. Hi. Hi. Um, I loved your presentation, um, but I have a question. Uh, why did you stop at 1945? Uh, what about mm. the refugees from the concentration camps? Oh, you mean uh, displaced persons, like the, yes. the people who survived and came? Yeah, yes. I mean, I, I was specifically looking at this because it, it does become kind of contextually a different world after the war. So you have the Cold War coming in, you have Americans still trying to figure out um, what our roles and responsibilities are. You have this idea of um, how do we denazify Germany? Should we bring in people who claim that they were forced to do things? It just, to me, I was already talking for 50 minutes and it felt like um, I wanted to be able to tell those stories. I, I can do a presentation on after the war um, if anybody's interested at some point, but it does feel kind of contextually like a different place. Um, 1933 America is very different from 1945 America, and everyone is looking at all of these questions in in the light of a superpower as opposed to one of uh, as opposed to a non superpower, honestly. Um, so, and we are looking at a pre Holocaust world and a post Holocaust world, and and looking at the issues of refugees and displaced persons in a post Holocaust world when we actually have that history to look back on. Um, people are responding 
unfortunately in some similar ways, but in some kind of fundamentally different ways too. But as you, as you, I think are pointing out, it does not solve our refugee crisis. Like there is still very much a refugee crisis after the war and people who do not have homes to go back to. And it takes a very long time for the US to do much of anything to assist them, I would say. Thank you, Eva. Uh, oh, I, it's just, <clears throat> um, it's just, to me, um, we continue to have a refugee crisis that's more like after the war than mm. before the war or during the war. You know, the Sudanese, the Vietnamese, you know, people who have no homes mm -hmm. and the, um, the immigration laws are worse now than they were during the war, in my opinion. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not the next. I mean, they're different. They're different, right? Because we do have theoretically refugee protections and asylum protections. Whether those things are working is something that I think is up for debate. But it is a different kind of legal construct um, when you're talking about people fleeing. And you do see, you know, there's a there's a great article that I wrote um, for, sorry, that, that felt braggy. I didn't mean that to come out as braggy. Um, there's a very, there's an article that I think is very useful, let's say, um, on the Holocaust Museum website on US immigration and refugee law between 1921 mm -hmm. and 1980, that really gets into um, the ways in which the presidents use parole power after the war in a way that maybe could have been used in the 1930s to assist Jewish refugees. The idea that um, the president actually has the power to parole people into the United States um, and that they can become immigrants uh, and, and be become citizens that way. Um, there are kind of these new ideas about human rights and about refugee law that come in some cases in response to the Holocaust um, that really inform what is happening now. And so this is, I think, a really crucial history to learn um, and uh, agreed the history of what happens after this is a crucial history for us to learn because it is the building block for what we are debating now. Mm -hmm. That actually leads us to a question from uh, Ronnie that says, is there any proof that German refugees were spies? Yeah, no, <laughs> there is one, um, one German Jewish man who is arrested and tried as a spy. Um, just one, and he is not arrested until 1942. So as all of those reports and all of those um, articles and accusations are, are being written, they have absolutely no proof, no one to point to. There are a couple of whistleblowers who say that they have proof and testify in front of Congress about hearing things, about knowing things, um, but they cannot find any sort of evidence that this is actually happening. Um, and this one man, it, it's a, it's a absolutely bonkers story of somebody who he was also one of the leading experts on the city of Atlantis, the lost city of Atlantis. Um, so someday I'm going to write like a slate article about this, this one man who spied for Germany, who had also been interned in a concentration camp, gets out, spies for Germany, is an expert in Atlantis. Um, it's a sort of like thing that makes you absolutely fascinated about history because people are just incredibly interesting and he is one of those incredibly interesting people but he is the only one that i have ever heard of or found wow <laughs> yeah um, right <laughs> that's crazy um yep. how long so if we can like talk about your book for a minute like sure. how long so you just gave us a 15 minute presentation which is astonishing how long did it take you to do the research to write your book um, so my book was based on my doctoral dissertation. So my, my book is the history of the war refugee board, that agency that I talk about okay. at the very end of the war. Um, and all of the things they do, opening the refugee camp, hiring Raoul Wallenberg, they launder money to get um, refugee aid uh, to help refugees escape into Sweden illegally. Um, they send about a hundred, the equivalent of about $154 million in, in aid into Europe in the final year of the war. It actually is a real US effort. Um, it doesn't come until 1944, but it is real and it is significant. And it probably did save tens of thousands of lives. Um, and so one of the things that I argue, I think in the book is that this is a model that we could use now 
but we've completely forgotten about it because we have this idea that is not incorrect of US response to the Holocaust as being not enough, not something worth looking back on as a model, certainly. Um, but there are pieces and there are people that we should study and add because they can add something to this history and, and to us moving forward. Um, so the whole process of, of doing all of that research, it was the first history of this organization. Um, and I wrote it based on their records, not based on anybody else's books. Um, it took about five years to write my doctoral dissertation and then about another two years to, to put it into book form. Um, I specifically did not want the book to be geared towards other academics. They have my dissertation, they can look at my dissertation. I wanted to tell the story of, of these young people who are idealistic government workers, um, who are trying to figure out how to save Jews on a continent that they've never seen with all of this intelligence coming at them or not coming at them. Um, how do you conceive of trying to stop the Holocaust as a 30 year old in Washington, DC? And so that is the story of, of the book. Um, I'm really proud of it. I, I hope you do check it out. Um, but it's, it's uh, this idea that we can be our better angels, I think is something that, that really resonates with me that this is, we can emulate this. Um, and the government can emulate this. And it doesn't have to be either or, it can be yes and. We can um, be a force of good for the world. And that was something that they really believed in is something that I believe too. Bravo, bravo. Uh, does anyone have any questions, comments? You'll probably all hang up and then think of a hundred, right? <laughs> and if that happens, so if you do, tell Isabel and yes. she'll send them to me. You can email me and I will forward them on. Um, it was a pleasure to see all of you. I am so thankful that you all were here. And is there a last minute question? Someone just will it, yeah. yes. Will there a recording yeah. be of it be made available? Yes, to answer the question about the recording, um, it will be made available. If you get our newsletter, I will let you know in the newsletter as soon as it's it's open for you. And then you guys can either click on it from there or email me and let me know that you would like it. Um, it might take a week or so, but we'll have it, we'll have it ready for you very soon. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Jack's iPad has her hand up. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I do. Great presentation, very informative. Thank you. Uh, who, well, we could discuss the ship, the St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, where does the responsibility lie with the refusal for that ship bringing these people, I believe it was mostly Germany, and mm -hmm. would they could President Roosevelt, who in many of American Jews, adored President mm -hmm. Roosevelt. And now when you look back, like you, you know, I, I, I wonder, is, is it his fault? Was it anti-Semitism at that time? Could he have done more to have pushed Congress? Oh, that's a really good question. Okay. So the, the, what happened with the passengers of the St. Louis, I think the blame can be spread widely. I would put most of the blame on Cuba, um, I would say. So the passengers of the St. Louis, there are a little more than 900 passengers on the St. Louis. It's a special sailing from Hamburg to Havana uh, in May, 1939. The passengers have entry visas to Havana, um, not immigration visas to the United States. They have no paperwork for the United States. Uh, they are meant to land in Cuba. Many of the passengers are on the waiting list to the United States planning to submit their paperwork to the consulate in Havana um, once their turn comes up on the waiting list. So they get to Havana. Um, Cuba declares that they're not going to allow the passengers to land. Um, they had allowed about 8,000 German Jews to arrive in Havana in the six months previous. And they discovered that the man, um, their kind of director of immigration was profiting from the sale of these landing permits. Uh, the State Department estimated that he had received about a million dollars in 1939 money 
Um, so about $14 million today selling these landing permits to German Jews, to desperate German Jews trying to get out. So they negotiate, the US State Department and the, the joint negotiate for about a week with the Cuban government, trying to convince them to at least let these passengers land. We won't send any more, but please at least let these passengers land. Let the people who have already paid for their landing permit come. Um, the Cuban government finally says, we will not negotiate any further if the boat is still docked in the, in the harbor. So the boat goes up, it, it leaves, it goes off the coast of Miami um, to kind of wait and circle in the hopes that those negotiations will continue. The passengers and their people on in the United States, their family members in the United States start petitioning the US government to do something about it. Roosevelt never responds. We don't have any sort of reaction from him at all um, about this largely because he's entertaining the king and queen at the time. That is the exact same time that they are visiting the United States. They're up in Hyde Park um, doing that whole thing. So the United States never formally responds. Um, Canada never formally responds. And so the joint starts in New York, starts working with the State Department, um, particularly diplomats in Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and Luxembourg. I'm sorry, Belgium, yeah. Belgium, the Netherlands, and France mainly. Um, and England um, to divvy up the passengers so that if the ship goes back to Europe, they will not be sent back to Germany. So halfway across the Atlantic on their way back, they are successful. They find out that Britain, the Netherlands, France, and Belgium will divvy up the passengers. So none of them are going back to Germany. There is a massive celebration on board the ship. Um, the joint actually even makes a fundraising film um, talking about what a great job they did with the St. Louis. <laughs> this is considered a huge success story. Um, of course, we know now that less than a year later, three of those countries are going to be invaded and that um, of the passengers of the St. Louis, 254 will be murdered in the Holocaust. Um, the rest will survive the war. Some of them will immigrate to the United States. Some of them survive in hiding. Some of them are in England and are fine. Um, so it is a really complicated story. I would put most of the blame on Cuba, um, but Roosevelt certainly, he doesn't have a lot of leeway without Congress. He could have declared them, um, you know, figured out some sort of way to, I guess, declare them uh, permission to enter. But a lot of aid organizations are actually against that idea. The idea that if, if we just blanket open it up, that people will just rent boats and try to land in the United States. And that will shatter any sort of immigration law we have. And so it isn't really just the State Department saying no, it is also aid agencies who are trying to keep rein on who is coming and where they're coming from and to keep you know entry kind of manageable for them. Um, it is just such a complicated and nuanced and horrific story that you look back on and there isn't Kind of one right answer to it and there isn't one victim to or one villain to blame um there is it's just spread everywhere it's spread in u.s law it's spread in canadian law it's spread with cuba's refusal to let them in it's just spread everywhere um there aren't a lot of the you know the heroes are the passengers and the captain um and the joint does a great job with the with the St. Louis, but it is a really complicated story. So I apologize for the very long answer. The the St. Louis is a really complicated story, and I wanted to make sure that that you actually heard kind of the the long version. Thank you for for that, Dr. Erbelding. There is another question. Yeah, it says to what extent? This is from Patty. To what extent was the lack of U.S. response to the Holocaust conditioned by the failure? to comprehend the magnitude of Hitler's war against the Jews. That's a big part of it. Yeah, that is a big part of it. And the fact that by the time we comprehend it, we are at war. You know, we are not on the continent. We have to, if you remember D-Day, we have to in, literally invade the continent to get back on. Um, so we are very, very militarily far away. And the idea that militarily we could intervene to rescue people is something that is really difficult, um, really difficult to imagine, even to, to come up with a what if um, regarding that is, is just really tricky. And so it, there is a, a massive gap between information and um, 
knowledge and belief, I would say. You can have information, but you can't know it. And then when you know it, you may not believe it. And then translating from belief to then action, um, it's just huge leaps for people, especially in the 1940s. It, it just seems like Walter LeCur's argument about the failure to comprehend that really yeah. resonates. It, it, it yeah, really yeah. has staying power in the long run. Yeah, and if you look at Felix Frankfurter's reaction mm -hmm. to John Karski, where yeah. he says, yeah. I, I'm not saying you're not telling me the truth. I'm saying I cannot believe you. Exactly. And which is why liberation is such a surprise. They have all the information, but seeing mm -hmm. it still is really, really shocking for people. Even if they know all of it, you still might not know. I mean, right. I've studied this my whole life and yeah. I would still be shocked. I still don't know, mm -hmm. you know? Okay, thank you. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Well, what an evening this has been. <laughs> I, it's, it's eight minutes after eight and we, the library is closed. I just got a text from my coworkers that they're leaving the building. And I said, please leave the light on for me. Um, <laughs> but um, if you have further questions, feel free to email me. Please come in and check out Dr. Erbelding's book. I think that it will be a very interesting read. And I, uh, Dr. Rebecca, I appreciate your time so, so much. I yeah, wish you could you have so been much. here in person. I know this me too. It was originally supposed to be in person. It was. Um, but, you know, th things as they are, traveling. It allowed us to go eight minutes over. Yeah, well, it did. You would have gotten kicked out of the library. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, but that. thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. it the gift of your, your knowledge is, is fantastic. Thank you to everyone who's here tonight. Please check out the other programs coming down the pike and sign up and come in and uh, yeah, have a great night. Yeah. And thank you very much. Thank you so Bye, much everybody. for everything.